Um, as I said before, hi, my name is Cindy Joy, and I'll be presenting how the film Freedom Riders, directed by Richard Mugrimanese, demonstrates the shortcomings in the American education system, specifically its disregard and inaction towards diversity and intersectionality. The American education system is recognized as a symbol of opportunity in higher learning. It's understood to guarantee success for those who apply themselves to their education. So work hard and you go far, work harder and you go farther. That is the concept in simple terms. However, this notion of equality and opportunity through hard work has failed around 2 million students who entered high school in 2019. 2 million students who were unable to graduate high school. The percentage of dropouts being around 5%. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, but for every 20 students, one student fails. Factors that contribute to high dropout rates include poor living conditions, familial circumstances, lack of support, and I'm sure most of us in the room can think of a few other factors that would help. Now, it's understood that some of these factors are out of the school system's control. We can't control when or where a child is born, or their parental figures, or their financial circumstances. But what we can do is prevent the fallout and limitations created by these circumstances. And this is where the education system is currently faltering. It is the negligence to recognize and act upon those factums, factors where the system is failing its students. Freedom Riders portrays the system's dismissal of student diversity. Diversity, as mentioned before, as financial, familial, location, history, living conditions. With the movie being based on a true story, the film follows an English class living in a violent part of LA. The relation and influence of education in personal matters is represented in the film. In the lens I've used to break down the film, Audre Lorde's age, race, class, and sex, woman redefining difference, helps us further understand the film and its themes of diversity presented. Lord argues that the inability to recognize differences and support each other will hinder people from moving forward. Using that knowledge and watching the film, we are able to dive deeper and understand how the film demonstrates the negligence of the American education system, resulting in the failure and oppression of its most vulnerable students. In order to grasp the concept of its negligence, we first need to become familiar with a few words. Intersectionality is defined as the overlapping of factors that discriminate or oppress an individual. Using the lens, although Laura doesn't outright use the word intersectionality, she does include and elaborate on the concept by introducing the mythical norm. The mythical norm is defined as what society idealizes as normal or favorable. Lord states that in the case of America, the mythical norm is someone who is white, thin, male, young, heterosexual, Christian, and financially secure. And those who are further away from this mythical norm experiences more challenges and oppression. So for example, a gay black woman would experience more oppression than a black woman because she's further away from the mythical norm. In the case of education, the school system only caters to those who are fit the stand, who fit the standard of being financially secure, of having a place to work, having free time after school, stable life, and all the stuff that you can think of. That is the school system's mythical norm. The English class in Freedom Writers represents this, represents those who do not fit this educational norm, with the opening scene being the Rodney King riots in 1992, which were a bunch of riots that erupted across LA due to police brutality. It is established that the student's environment is violent, dangerous, and hateful, making it nearly impossible for them to focus on their education. In the film, the students write their experiences with, in their English journals, and they describe being abused, being homeless, witnessing crime, juvenile hall, and seeing death on the streets. The English class represents the kids and students who have lived and continue to live under unimaginable circumstances. 
And even so, the education system still expects them to perform at the same level as kids who are financially stable, who have comfortable living conditions, who have that support and that free time. The education system is mythical to work. All the students may be provided the same textbooks and teachers and classes, but they are not provided the same platform to start from. They do not experience the same amount of intersections. One of my favorite examples of this is a personal one with me and my classmate sophomore year. We had chemistry together and one week he didn't show up for maybe two days. And so when he got back, I shared my notes with him because I like to help when I can. And I eventually asked, why were you gone? And he responded with that he had to help his parents build something. And that's when I noticed the red on his back from working outside, the sunburn. He had sunburn all across his back. Now the situation wasn't like crazy or anything, he's okay, so don't worry about him, he's, he's good. But it, the situation was enough for me to start noticing how different each student's circumstances are. I've been blessed with a mother who emphasizes education and makes enough money to support me and whatever I want to do. And I have a comfortable home to study in and a remarkable support system of family and friends. But not everyone receives that. Some have siblings they need to care for or jobs they need to go to straight after school. Some have households so loud that they can't study or think or neighborhoods so dangerous that they can't sleep. Not every student will fit the mythical norm and it's unjust and it's unrealistic to expect them to. Lord elaborates on this negligence, stating, the outsider whose experience and tradition is too alien to comprehend. She's stating that when something different and an unfamiliar is introduced, many people may flag it as too alien or too different to try to understand. When applied to education in the film and in real life, it means that differences in students' lifestyles and experiences are too often labeled as too different for the education system to make an effort to try to understand or adjust to. Which is highly disagreeable because that approach defeats what education stands for. It stands for growth and betterment, and there is no growth in negligence. Freedom Writers demonstrates this in the scenes when the department head, Margaret Campbell, which is on screen, tries to explain to the English teacher, Erin Gruwell, why her class receives lower developed to no material, no field trips, no additional support or activities. Campbell's defense was always that their grades were low, it's not proper grades, or how their backgrounds are not welcoming or supportive. Instead of attempting to understand and act upon the obstacles preventing the students from gaining a proper education, the school decided that their poor results and conditions defined and determined their capabilities. I do believe that we should give attention to the kids that do show results and that do show effort, but I don't believe that means that we should turn our back on the kids that are having a harder time. Defining and restricting students' capabilities because they are seen as too different or alien is not what education should be teaching. Lord tells us that Refusing to recognize differences makes it impossible to see the different problems and pitfalls facing us. And she's right. The reluctance to recognize the differences and needs within our education system will prevent us from accommodating for them. And that will leave vulnerable students oppressed. How will we move forward if millions of students are being left behind because they are too different or too alien? If they're too far gone to be changed for it? And what is worth the effort if not our children and our students and ultimately our future? By becoming aware of the intersectionalities present, we will have the capability to enrich the education and possibility of our peers and children. Through changing our schooling methods, we can learn to accommodate students' needs, providing each of them an equal or as close to equal as possible support system, and it is possible. 
I've read some programs online or something working towards supporting kids that need it, like the Apollo 20 program in Houston. It works, but I think that we can do better. There are schools that provide daycares and parenting classes for teen parents, and schools that push for after-school tutoring hours. My school, personally, does, works with the Houston Food Bank to have food drives almost two or three times a month, and it helps feed families in the community for free who struggle to feed themselves. Change is possible. Although it will be hard, change is necessary to grow. And learning is a part of education. As I may conclude with a quote from Lord, change means growth, and growth can be painful. This can mean new paths to our survival. Thank you. Okay, and for Sydney, um, I've never seen um, Freedom Riders, but I'm only watching now, but I also want to know, why'd you pick it? Um, I have many reasons, but I guess the starting reason was my friends. I love going to school, and the kids around me, like I said before that I noticed, they struggle with things that I don't, or I struggle with things that they don't. So I started doing more research, and when I watched the movie, and how those kids struggled with so much, yet had so much fun, they reminded me of the kids that I spent time with, the, my friends. And so I wanted to look into it and see how we can make the system better for not only me and my friends, but for future people. Uh, Sydney, I, I guess, uh, I guess my question is, you talked about how the education system um, is, 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 is causing oppression, but then at other times that you talked about how it's it's neglecting its duty to uh, to mitigate that. Uh, so is it, it is the issue that it is not doing it a very good job of uh, correcting these uh, intersectional forces that are detrimental or is the education system itself being detrimental to them? I think that it unwillingly does create scenarios where kids cannot move forward and I think the main purpose or no the main purpose of my presentation is to try to get the system to work harder. So yes, they do have systems, but as the statistics show, it's not working as well as it could be. So yes, this, it creates scenarios where it creates oppression, but I don't think it means to. It, it's trying to fix it, but I think we can do better to fix it. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I have a question. Um, how can, uh, like, do you think it's possible that, uh, to abandon like, the mythical uh, norms that we have, or um, how can we liberate others who don't have the best circumstances or access to education? I think to abandon it is the goal, mm -hmm. but it's going to be really hard because we've seen throughout hundreds of years that there are all, there's always some sort of norm or ideal thing, but the goal is to eliminate the norm. And I think that we should for, so what was the second part? It was, um, how can we liberate others who don't have the best circumstances or access to education? So implementing better programs and doing more research. We do have programs, but like I said before, it's not really working as well as it could be. So I think if we put more time and money and research into finding what does work and implementing them, it could work. So like I said, after school tutoring, some kids can't study at home. So if they could stay after school for a bit and get a ride home, that would be great. And maybe even helping teachers find ways to handle situations or look for signs and let the children know that it's okay. Because sometimes pride does take a factor in why kids won't ask for help. So I think that that's a good way of reaching out and also letting them know it's okay. Does anyone have another question? I have a question for Sydney. 
So you like, briefly mentioned in your presentation about like the Apollo program in Houston. I was just wondering what that was. I watched a video about it in my class actually, and the Apollo 20 program took several schools in an area where students were involved in, you know, substances and illegal activities, and their home lives are not as great, and so their grades were suffering because of that and many of them were not finishing school or they didn't see the point in school so they started implementing more like parenting classes like i said because there was a lot of pregnancy a lot of students were pregnant and you know more tutoring more flexible ways for them to be able to obtain their high school diploma without more flexible ways because some of them don't have as many things so that was the program and i thought it was very interesting does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, I do. So, <laughs> what encouraged you guys throughout your presentation to just keep going with that theme? Anything in mind that it, that really stood out to you? You really wanted to do this presentation for any reason? <laughs> um, well, it's kind of like Chad's question. Um, my friends, I would, like I said, the movie had such sweet moments where it showed that they're still kids. They deal with gangs and their parents, but at the end of the day, they just want to laugh. And that reminded me of the people I'm surrounded with, and I would think of them and how I want them to be able to be able to make the grades they want to without having to struggle as more than they should. For me, uh, it was a theme of generational trauma and also intersectionality because in all honesty, all of us, we can all apply that in some way or another, whether we know someone who like understands generational trauma or whether we've been through it because generational trauma is pretty present in everyone's life in one way or another, whether it's established by our mother or father or our grandparents or our religion also because it's passed on. And I felt that it's something I could connect to because I know that my family, there it's not really spoken, but like you can see there's something there that's unsaid that's still affecting us. And from intersection intersectionality, all of us are inter, have intersectional forces that make up who we are, whether it be our race, our age, or our identity or sexuality. Um, for me, I took. British Lit with, with Professor Serna and in one of the projects this was my topic and it kind of just sparked my interest like for learning about the oppression for women in England and how they continue to adapt to the changes and then um, like just like the history behind how women uh, like got where they were. Thank you very much for your response. Any other questions? I think that concludes our meeting.